Um, so by regionality, as I understand it from your article, we're basically speaking about the tradition you, to which you've already alluded that Othman sent, had copies of the, um, the codex, that is the version of the Quran that he produced, um, sent to at least um, four different uh, cities. I mean, I think it's been recognized already in classical scholarship and then early in Western scholarship that um, this wasn't, you know, <laughs> he didn't have uh, a scanner. Mm -hmm. And so um, the versions that he had written down um, weren't precisely the same in very minor ways, in a very limited number of ways, but definite ways, there's differences. So does that sound okay? What would you add to that account of um, the regions? Yeah, so that's the exact uh, idea is basically, you know, you, you, you create a master copy and then you make copies uh, of the master copy and then you, you sort of distribute them across the empire. And um, so the first person to make the observe, so uh, actually one important piece is uh, uh, in, in classical works like al muqna by ad uh, and uh, uh, Abu Ubaid's work, Fadal al-Qur'an and things like that, and Farra, so many early uh, classical works mention or record uh, uh, a number of discrepancies between these codices. And uh, I would say, as far as I'm aware, Noldico was the first person to realize that the pattern formed by those discrepancies, they actually form a stemma. And so, so uh, what is a stemma? A, a stemma is essentially sort of a, um, a, a familiar relationship between texts. So if you imagine if I produce a document and then I give that document to uh, a number of students and tell them to copy it in the process of copying. So think about not you know, a photocopy or a Xerox machine, but sort of hand, uh, hand copying, uh, uh, different students might introduce uh, different mistakes, right? So they might not copy it perfectly. And then as uh, students of those students make copies, um, other mistakes will get introduced and you can trace the lineage and recreate a, a family tree, essentially, of the relationship between these codices. So what Noldeka noticed initially is that the, the, the list of discrepancies between uh, those ascribed to Medina, uh, Sham, so Syria, uh, Basra and Kufa form a stemma, while Mecca, uh, the, the list of variants attributed to Mecca stand out a little bit. They don't quite fit in neatly. Uh, now, what Michael Cook does is he sort of takes them and, and he's a little more critical uh, um, and he, he basically uh, enumerates all possible uh, stemma, uh, uh, stemmas that can be formed by those particular variants. Uh, Noldica had uh, basically suggested that the Medinan copy was the, was the archetype from which the other uh, three copies were made. Uh, and Cook says, well, we can't really be sure about that. So, so he kind of uh, uh, refines Noldica's uh, initial uh, uh, proposal. Now, that's all great based on the literary sources. But, you know, the question is, uh, does that actually hold true in the sort of material witnesses that we have in the manuscripts? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was sort of the impetus behind my work on the regionality of Quranic codices. Now, other folks like uh, Yassin Dutton and Marine Van Puta, they they'd sort of studied individual manuscripts and, and they'd noticed that, uh, and even De Roche in some of his works, they'd noticed that certain manuscripts, they did more or less follow along in terms of their variance with one uh, uh, regional tradition. So like this manuscript, you can say is by and large Syrian, etc. cetera. Uh, but nobody had gone through and sort of surveyed all of the available manuscripts uh, that we have, the early manuscripts, and, and seen if they, if they actually form a stemma. And if they do form a stemma, uh, how does that compare to the one uh, that uh, uh, Noldeke put forth and that Michael Cook refined? And so that's essentially the, 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 the core of my project. And so what I, what I do is I, I sort of look at things in two different ways. I say, if we take the, the traditional literature and I go through and I, I collect a lot more variants than what uh, uh, Nolde can cook uh, use, which they basically relied on, on uh, Mokner, which has kind of like a summary list, but I go through earlier works and I, I collect more of them. Uh, and I say, okay, this is sort of the list based on the, uh, and this is actually another important point is no two uh, uh, classical Muslim scholars agree on a list of variants between the different regional masahif, the different regional codices. Uh, uh, some report one or two, some report long lists between those of Iraq and Medina, and you know it, it's a mixed bag. And so what I do is I kind of sift through them and I organize them in a structure and I separate between well-attested ones in the literature and poorly attested ones. Uh, and then what I do is I, I, I go to those locations in the manuscripts and I collect all of the, the variants that are found there. And I don't class it, I just kind of collect the raw data. And I use uh, uh, a technique known as phylogenetic analysis. So 
it's the same way, you know, we can, you know, take your DNA and your children's DNA and your, your cousin's DNA, and we can kind of reconstruct the family tree without asking you, is this person your parent? Is this person your cousin? Is this person your sibling? We can know that on the basis of mutations uh, or slight variation and, and shared a genetic material between you and other individuals. Uh, and of course, this applies to the level of species as well. We can do this with uh, variants in manuscripts too. And so what I show is if you take uh, the earliest manuscripts and you reconstruct uh, uh, the family tree, so this the, the stemma from it, it essentially reflects more or less identically what we get from the literary sources. Now, uh, there are, you know, the devil is always in the details. There are some very important details that I, uh, uh, I do highlight in my, in my paper. So I would say the first one is the fact, so I mentioned that no two, you know, classical sources have the same exact right. lists of right. variants. Right. And what's very interesting is we can compare some of the variants that are given in those lists with what we find in manuscripts and we find discrepancies. So it's not a perfect, the actual variants themselves are not a perfect match. And the interesting discrepancies is they allow us to date when those reports were written, or at the very least, what manuscripts, what date the manuscripts that were relied on come from, uh, what, 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 uh, what time period, because, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's important to mention that Quranic orthography evolved over time, it got sort of upgraded in a little bit. So, so for example, you know, medial elifs, like the Malik and Malik example we talked about, mm -hmm. as, as sort of time went on, more often, you find the medial elif written in manuscripts to sort of make things more explicit. Uh, and there are other things with case vowels as well. And what you find is in the earliest manuscripts that we have, uh, certain words were spelled differently than, say, manuscripts that are about a century later from the second century. And so that kind of gives you an idea that, well, these reports probably don't come from the first century, from the, the sort of contemporaneous to the canonization of the text by Uthman. They come from a, a time period a little bit later. And then by sort of looking at the pattern and how Muslim scholars documented these variants, uh, I sort of infer that knowledge of these variants sort of emerged organically as uh, people traveled and, and things like that and they compared their different uh, codices they sort of became aware of these minor differences and minor discrepancies and started documenting them systematically and of course no two menu no two copies of a manuscript are perfectly identical so someone might be looking at maybe a slightly more archaic manuscript and document things a little bit differently and than someone else and also of course as diffusion uh, takes place across the empire what also happens is people start to pick and choose like you know i really think this other variant is very nice so let me put it in my manuscript so you get something like hybrid hybrid exactly version. so you get this contamination uh, what we would call it. It's not a sort of a, a, a loaded term, it's just descriptive. Uh, but in the same way, even the Hafs tradition, so Hafs, even so the reading traditions, they don't necessarily follow 100% their regional codices. So Hafs violates sort of or goes against, deviates from the Kufin uh, uh, manuscript in, right. in, in two instances as well. Uh, okay. so, so that allows us to sort of get this landscape of what uh, of sort of the the for, the the the, uh, the regional codices and sort of the emergence of the traditions that document those variants. Okay, so I have the big question to ask you about what this means for the coherence of the traditional narrative or its likelihood. But before we get there, um, it, uh, could you help us understand how you can look at a manuscript and classify it according to one of the cities, one of the the four cities? Um, is, does that make sense? Because the manuscript doesn't have like a stamp which says, oh, I came from Kufa, Basra, Medina, <laughs> or, um, or Damascus, or, or Hems, depending on which one you choose in Syria, right? So is it just the preponderance of readings that line up with the traditional reports that lead you to identify it? Yeah. And is there a danger of circularity there? Mm. That's a great question. So, um, there are, uh, so uh, for example, in my paper and Cook and Noldica, we have sort of lists, uh, ta tables that contain sort of uh, uh, the, the regional variants. So the specific ones that are found in the Medinan Mus'haf, the, I would say the Himsi Mus'haf, uh, uh, the Kufan and the, and the Basran. And of course, those aren't the only regional Mus'haf that are out there. There's also a Meccan Mus'haf and potentially others that we don't know about. So again, uh, in the traditional reports, you, you sometimes you get mention of Mus'hafs that were sent to Bahrain and Yemen and, and things like that as well. Well, and uh, we just we don't have any witnesses to those uh, uh, those texts, so we can't speak of them. Which is why I say at least four codices. Now the Meccan one, so we do have lists of variants for the Meccan codex. What's interesting about the the Meccan codex is based on the the variants that are given, uh, it's a hybrid codex. So it is sort of uh, dependent uh, 
on at least two of the four codices we mentioned. So it, it's not that it's impossible that uh, uh, certainly a Meccan codex at some point existed uh, because there was a Meccan reading tradition. But the question is, was it uh, sort of an original uh, or was it a uh, 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 sort of a descendant, a child of those four uh, manuscripts? And, and the way I see it, based on the analysis of the variants, it's, a, it's dependent on uh, uh, at least two of the four original uh, archetypal codices. So to be hyper clear about this, just because a manuscript today is located in Damascus, for example, or Cairo, or well, maybe Cairo is a bad example, or Medina, doesn't mean that it's from that particular uh, reading, not reading tradition, but that particular stemma of the of the regional codices. That's an excellent point. Thanks for bringing it up, actually. So now when we use the term regional, does this, you know, this manuscript belong to a specific, ha have a specific regionality? Uh, I like to think of regionality as sort of from a, a, a uh, as a text type or a subtext type. So there is the, you know, you can say, uh, and I sort of give them uh, uh, designations like that in, in my paper, but you can talk about the, the B text type or the Basran text type, uh, the K text type, the Kufin, you know, the M text type, the Medinan and the S text type, the Syrian and C the Meccan text type. So uh, uh, solely sort of in terms of a, uh, a classification uh, of the manuscripts, of course, manuscripts are very mobile. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, clearly knowledge of these variants diffused across the empire pretty quickly. And so there's nothing that demands someone writing, uh, a manu copying a manuscript in, in, in Damascus uh, must have uh, chosen to copy the Syrian one uh, the, uh, along with the Syrian variants. Yeah, maybe a simple point, but uh, uh, just in case it's helpful for some of the viewers. Um, you alluded to um, other traditions which uh, have additional Amsar, by the way, Amsar uh, is the word which means some, something like uh, military garrison city um, in the context of the Islamic conquest. Mm -hmm. um, so these cities, I mean, Kufan Basra are classical examples of them, um, but you know, Damascus might be included, even though that's an ancient city um, of settlements that were established during the conquest and in, in which early Muslims settled. Um, uh, so um, related, by the way, to the Arabic word for Egypt, uh, Mithir. Um, uh, so um, uh, we have these other reports. I believe Yaqubi, for example, includes a tradition that um, Bahrain, at least Bahrain, maybe Yemen, are mentioned. Um, but but uh, it, it, that's not to be taken seriously, it sounds like, because we don't actually have um, within the literature uh, coherent lists of variants attributed to that um, that Misr, that city. Yeah, that's a, a good a good observation. So uh, I think the earliest person to mention Bahrain and Yemen is actually uh, uh, Abu Hatim al Sijistani. So he's also a uh, uh, third century uh, uh, Hijri scholar. So what I uh, the way I like to think about it is uh, is this is. Uh, and it does bring up the question of like, not all reports are created alike. So you can't, you know, uh, uh, look at every report and take it at face value and, and weight it the same and say, well, you know, there was a report that mentioned seven cities, one that mentions five, et cetera. And that's something I, I do a little bit of in, in, in my paper. So a, a couple of, 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 of points to make. So number one, from a sort of a uh, historical critical perspective, if we want to reconstruct what happens from material evidence, what we have are manuscripts. And we can only go uh, as far as the manuscripts allow us to go. Mm -hmm. And the manuscripts simply do not admit more than four archetypal uh, uh, codices, right? So that's the, that's the key point. So whether or not a manuscript, I mean, certainly we have manuscripts recovered from Sana'a Yemen, which you alluded to earlier in the conversation. So there were Qur'ans in Yemen. Uh, I'm sure there were in Bahrain. But how did they relate? Did, but did Uthman? you know, uh, order copies to be made? Were they part of the original copies? Perhaps he sent some originally to the garrison cities, as you mentioned. By the way, Hems was a major garrison city early on, prior to the rise of Damascus, which I think uh, I, I do mention, and, and uh, it, it sort of uh, plays into why I think the, uh, that Uthman sent the Mus'haf to Hems as opposed to Damascus. Uh, but also, so so that's the, that's the important question, which is a historical one, right? And uh, uh, if one is to rely on the material evidence, uh, then it, it only points to, to at least at least four, at least to which all the manuscripts I have studied and basically have access to go back to. But the other aspect is we don't have, yes, we don't have lists of variants of the, of the Bahrain uh, Quran or of the Yemen one, but we do of the Meccan one. And what's very interesting, and this is, is that the earliest reports we have, so we have one in Kitab al-Masahif that goes back to Hamza Zayyat, so he's one of the, the, the seven and the 10 canonical readers, uh, and we have al-Dani. So 
even though Adani, I'll put it this way, even though Adani documents variants from five regional codices, he including insists, Mecca, including Mecca right. he insists there are only four that Uthman sent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I think that speaks, uh, uh, and he says that this is the opinion of the majority of, of the scholars uh, uh, of his time. I think Pace, you know, uh, Abu Hatim al Sajistani, who kind of stands out. Um, and so to me, th uh, that along with sort of the, the report from Hamza and other, uh, other factors, uh, um, allow me to, to sort of say that the, the reports that do mention seven and even later on, so much later on, more, more people seem to converge towards five. They don't uh, uh, carry as much weight as, as the, uh, the report that mentioned four.